Ladies and gentlemen. Well, how do wars begin? This is perhaps the most constant theme of the historian. Wars make up much, most, of European history. Every civilization, there have been wars, at any rate, until we think our own time. Wars caused by all, in all kinds of different ways. Wars of conquest, wars of imperial rivalries, wars of family disputes, religious wars. The 18th century, they'd settled down into almost legalistic wars, wars over claims to descent into a, as to who had a right to the throne. The war of the Spanish succession, the war of the Polish succession, the war of the Austrian succession, and indeed you can say in the early 18th century, though we don't call it such, the war of the English succession, which brought the Hanoverians to the throne. In the last 200 years, there has been a profound change Wars have changed from being wars of states or rulers to being wars between nations. And it's these wars of the last 200 years or so that I was tempted to talk about to see if they had common character, what they were, what kind of things produced wars. And I looked and found, well, now that is where modern history began 200 years ago. But more than this, as I looked more into the French Revolution and the wars that it caused, I realized, in some ways, the most modern of all wars, a war brought about by rival systems of political outlook. Undoubtedly, the French Revolution of 1789 was the most formidable event in modern European history, the greatest change. Charles James Fox uh, said of it, and I think he was right, how much the greatest and how much the best event since the beginning of the world, though not everybody would agree about the second part of the phrase. What was it that made it so different? There had been revolutions, plenty of them, including incidentally a revolution in England which overthrew the monarch, but basically changes of family. The French Revolution was different because it brought into the world, and Europe in particular, of course, a new idea, the rights of man. And with the rights of man went the rights of nations, where previously states had been based on dynastic power. They were now based on national existence. In the old days, right up to 1789, a state was simply the property of its ruler. Madame de Pompadour called Louis XV France, even when she was in bed with him. And then suddenly there appeared the French people who said, we are France. And this was a challenge to all the dynasts of Europe. And there was a competition of propaganda and of assertion. With, as the French Revolution developed, the first liberal, then the radical, then the revolutionary leaders, staking out more aggressively the claims of the people of France, and in time, of course, the claims of others. After all, if France had the right to be a nation, if France was composed of its peoples and not just of its king, this applied to others. One of the factors which produced the Revolutionary War was the provocative uh, declaration which uh, the French Legislative Assembly made in November the 19th, 1791, uh, uh, sorry, 1792, promising help and fraternity to every nation seeking to recover its liberty. That's curious, incidentally, the word recover. Most of these nations had never had their liberty, but it was already a myth that there had been a distant time when peoples had all been free and had then been enslaved by their kings. And in answer to this, or in rivalry to this, the kings and emperors of Ro Europe met. As early as June 1791, they met at a place called Pilnitz, and they warned the French that unless they behaved better, unless they treated their king better, then the great powers of Europe would call them to order. And I think really the Declaration of Pilnitz marked the real beginning of the Revolutionary War, because here were these kings seeking to display their authority, to, to rebuke the French, to push them back 
into the discipline under Louis XVI. Instead, it provoked them forward. And there was, as I say, a steady competition. Something else curious about it, although two great powers, the one of monarchy, of tradition, of conservatism, the other of liberalism and nationalism, although these two powers were moving against each other, neither of them looked at it in practical terms. The armies of old Europe, although they were competent professional forces, were not uh, at all equipped to fight a battle of nations. They were not at all equipped to occupy a foreign country and to suppress it. They thought that warnings would be enough. And for that matter, with the revolution in France, the French army had practically collapsed. And none of the uh, violent statesmen who were preaching uh, war or at any rate resistance to the rest of Europe had the slightest idea what the French army was, was like. Instead, they each side thought that phrases would be enough. That's a common case, too, before a war, that if you assert conservatism, assert revolutionary principles, that this in itself will shake things. Strangely enough, though France was the one threatened, it was the French revolutionary government which finally plunged into war, declared what threatened Austria in April 1792, and then actually went to war though unable to do very much. Why? Because one of them said, the time has come to start a new crusade, a crusade for universal liberty. At the same time, there was a more practical consideration. King Louis XVI was really intriguing with the other kings, and the revolutionaries hoped that with war, it would appear how he had really been uh, disloyal to his own country. A revolutionary leader, Brissot, said, what we want is some great treason. And in fact, it was this that worked, that when the French revolutionary armies uh, encountered the armies of the old regime and were defeated, the cry arose, as it usually does, of course, in a, a, a war, the cry arose of treason, that we are betrayed. It's the very same cry which the French raised in 1940 when they were again defeated. Dif people find it difficult to imagine that a defeat can happen for perfectly practical causes and not for the cause of, of treason. And indeed, Louis XVI was deprived of his power. Uh, one episode, one date is memorable, as I think the beginning of the modern world, and it's not only I who say so. On the 20th of September, 1792, the French troops, who up to that time had hardly fought at all, stood in line at a place called Valmy when the Prussian army advanced against them. There was not really heavy fighting. There was a cannonade. And for the first time, really, the new French revolutionary troops did not run away. The Prussians pulled back. And Goethe, who was the great poet who was with the Prussian uh, officers, said, gentlemen, you have this day taken part in the birth of a new world. Birth only, there was a great deal more. The French Revolutionary Wars, much more ragged than modern wars, they came here a bit and there a bit. Uh, it was not until the beginning of 1793 that this war really began to extend all over Europe. And then there was a great deal of muddle about it. In 1792, England, I call it England, and we're not allowed to do that nowadays, but in those days everybody called it England. It would be confusing if I called it anything else. In 1792, England, the English government, had claimed that they stand, would stand aloof, that although they were not by any means a revolutionary country, they had a constitution, they couldn't join with the absolute monarchs. At the same time, there was increasing apprehension, not only about France, but about the movement of revolutionaries, of Jacobins, inside the country. There was the, a, an anti-Jacobin panic. After all, the greatest of all revolutionary statements of principle, I think the greatest statement of democratic principles ever made, although it was called the rights of man, which was a French idea, was written by an Englishman, Tom Paine. And increasingly, the British government faced with discontent, with demands for parliamentary reform and so on, used France as the excuse for a policy 
of repression. It's always tempting when you have political discontent in your own country to say it's the fault of some other country and not of your government. Early in 1793, the British government demanded that France, the French revolutionaries, should withdraw their promise of support for peoples who wish to recover their liberty. And the French revolutionary government had by then swung very much further to the left. Two things, in fact, marked the last days of January 1793, both of them assertions of revolutionary principle. One was the execution of Louis XVI, uh, an execution which rather in the reverse direction of the British government persecuting the Jacobins, so the revolutionaries blamed Louis XVI for their defeat. And Danton said, the kings of Europe challenge us. We throw down to Europe the head of a king. It was there a defiance, a complete breach between revolutionary France and uh, the traditional estates of Europe. And at the same time, at the end of the month, revolutionary de France declared war on Great Britain. This began the first of the coalition wars. And it seemed to be a war of absolutely strict conflict of principles. On the one side, the allies, the great powers, the kings and emperors, were concerned, or so they said, to save civilization, by which they meant to save themselves. The French revolutionaries were concerned to carry through new and universal principles of enlightenment. Never for a moment did they suggest that the rights of man was simply something for France. It was something for others, and more than this, others must have it, whether they wanted it or not. When they invaded Belgium, for instance, the Belgians deeply regretted that the, the churches were secularized, that the monasteries and convents were all closed up. But they oughtn't to have done, you see. They ought to have welcomed liberation from the church, liberation from their traditional rulers. French enthusiasm for liberty easily became French dogmatism for liberty. And on both sides also, and it's fascinating to read the details of this, there were more practical considerations when the Allies uh, started their crusade to save conservatism and civilization, they also worked out the bits of French territory which they hoped to annex. And on the other side, the French revolutionary armies, when they began to achieve victories, they certainly brought with them liberation of a sort, liberation from the old traditional institution, liberation from the uh, kings and princes, liberation, as I said, also from uh, the Christian religion. But at the same time, they brought demands of a very practical nature. After all, the French said, we've done the fighting. We've liberated you. We've presented you with the rights of men. We had to pay not only all the money for these armies, we had to do actually uh, do the fighting for you as well. Therefore, you must pay us. Wherever the armies of liberty went in Europe, they imposed not only taxation, indemnities, they collected for so much so that there, there was a time when the French Revolutionary Wars were practically paying for themselves. And more than this, as the armies grew greater and more powerful, the apprehensions of the civilian politicians in Paris grew greater. What they wanted was that these revolutionary armies, splendid as they were in their spirit, devoted as they were to liberty and equality and fraternity, should not exert power in Paris itself. Indeed, one of the revolutionaries said, we must get these scoundrels to march as far away from France as possible. Revolution had become something for export. Now, we think, so far as we remember the wars at all, we think of them as one great block, a 20-year war which lasted from 1792 or 3 until 1814 or 15. It was, for all through the 19th century, called the Great War. But when I looked at it more closely, I realized that it was not a continuous war, and in a sense not even a continuing story, that there were in this war two entirely different epochs which uh, 
became confused afterwards, which had quite distinct character. The revolutionary wars which asserted the independence of France, which destro or destroyed or at any rate defeated the crusade for conservatism and reaction. These wars lasted a comparatively short time. <coughs> By 1794, all the territory of France had been cleared. By 1795, France had reached what were called the natural frontiers. It's another curiosity, by the way, just to continue all through the 19th century. The way in which a nation starts by claiming its national freedom, then says God or providence not only created this nation, but created natural frontiers for it. And there they are. A long way out, all of us you will find, natural frontiers mean more territory than you can claim for any other reason. By 1795, France had reached the natural frontiers of the Rhine and the Alps. By 1796, the French armies had swept into northern uh, Italy and had established friend satellite republics there. This first wave of revolutionary wars, of assertion of French power, came to an end just at the end of the 18th century. And there was a short and very important period of peace. In 1801, there was, although we forget it, universal peace in Europe. Even England and France were not at war. And when it started again, in 1804, the war had, I think, taken a different character. It taken a different character for two reasons. The first is that the French revolutionaries, the politicians who had, at this time, conducted France were replaced by a single man who in 1804 made himself emperor, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. The most powerful European emperor, I suppose, since the Middle Ages, and in a sense, the most significant European emperor since Roman times. Napoleon achieved power not on a promise of universal war and conquest, but on the promise of restoring order. And on the other side of the defeated allies, there was a continuing resentment. There again, when I looked at this history, the record of these Napoleonic wars, I realized how differently they seemed after the perspective of 150 or nearly 200 years to those who'd experienced the wars, and particularly those who just looked back to them, they were purely wars of French aggression, or shall we say, as many uh, French people said afterwards, pure Napoleonic aggression. After all, Napoleon's victories carried French arms and French authority right across Europe. And Historians have constantly speculated what kind of an empire did he want to achieve? Was he, as some have said, was he aiming at universal monarchy? When you look at this story in detail, how wars began, how these particular wars began, there emerges a striking contradiction, I think, of the traditional story. I was always going to say, I, I uh, hesitate to say this, because if you venture on an opinion of this kind, if you say, well, it really wasn't Napoleon who started these wars, uh, then this is felt to be something heterodox and provocative. But I think that's how it was. Let's take the first of them, the war which was resumed between Great Britain and, and France after a very brief period of, of peace. Uh, just when Napoleon had become emperor. What was the technical reason? The technical reason is not why wars started, but it is the, merely the spark. The technical reason is simply this, that during the Revolutionary War, the Royal Navy had occupied Malta. It was not theirs, it was not British. If anything, it belonged to the Knights of Malta, who'd been there for the last 400 years. And one of the terms of the Peace of Amiens between England and France, was that the British would give up Malta. When the time came, they refused to do so. They said to Napoleon, but you have not withdrawn from territories, you've, certain territories you've occupied in Europe, which was not mentioned in the Peace of Amiens. 
Therefore, we don't trust you and we're going to stay in Malta. Uh, the implication, which again and again, of course, appeared in British policy, that the British are entitled always to mistrust other people, but others, of course, are never entitled to mistrust uh, the British. Uh, that's why, of course, England is known or was known abroad as Perfid Albion, Perfidious Albion, because the British have two standards, one for themselves and one for other people. This was the actual uh, origin, renewal of the war. And from this time on, it was British policy to stir up new coalitions against Napoleon. Uh, the French referred to the British subsidies, because at that time the British had lots more gold than anyone else, and they used to pay it out in order to ensure that the Austrians or the Prussians, whoever it might be, did the fighting. The French used to refer to these subsidies as Pitt's cavalry, Pitt being the, the prime minister of the time. And right at the beginning of these uh, ten years, the pattern was set for wars which occurred regular intervals. British attempts to create a coalition, Napoleon, uh, with his partly instinctive shrewdness, partly with his much greater, inte greater intelligence service, getting his blow in first. It's one of the things that the British and other people greatly objected to about Napoleon, that just when you were conspiring to produce a great uh, coalition against him and uh, destroy him, he would destroy the coalition instead before you were ready. Unfair, it was often claimed to be, that Napoleon moved too fast. Time after time, the first and most dramatic occasion, of course, we think of it in terms of English history quite differently, is when in 1804 Napoleon assembled the army of England, with which he proposed to cross the Channel, and uh, occupy London. The project was not going well. It was not going well because Napoleon uh, had not got command of the seas. In fact, he was going very soon to lose command of the seas altogether. And while the French army was still at Boulogne, he heard that an Austrian army propped up on British subsidies was being built up on the Danube. He broke camp, the entire army of England moved across Europe. And remember, it's a much more formidable thing in those days. Uh, no railways, uh, indeed, not very good roads. And yet Napoleon, entirely of his own direction, was able to carry this army right across Europe and to surround the Austrian army at Ulm, 1805, October, before the Austrians knew he'd even left Boulogne. And in the further battles that followed, that coalition crumbled. The story was repeated in, in 1808. A second Austrian army accumulated, a second Austrian army surprised. And on each occasion, and this, of course, is, is I was going to say, Napoleon's real problem. When you win wars, you make gains. I mean by that, you not only defeat your enemy, but you accumulate further territories. The Napoleonic Empire was carried across Europe by war, not because this was its aim, but because it was its result. Napoleon was left more and more as the dominant factor in Europe, simply because he'd had to defeat these other countries which were conspiring against him. That's perhaps a little extreme expression. It would be foolish to suppose that Napoleon was a man of peace or a man of uh, kindly, um, gentle nature. And yet, repeatedly, in 1805, in 1808, and should one say in 1812, he was provoked into war. Now, that is the last but the most dynamic of the wars, Napoleon's decision to invade Russia. It's a thing which often happens with people, they decide to invade Russia. And whenever they do, it's always the same puzzle. Why on earth did they do it? Russia was remote from Europe. The idea that Russia would join into Europe, would take part in these conspiracies, though the Russians had taken part in the coalition in 1805, it seemed a little speculative. Napoleon was absolutely dominating Europe. Could it really believe that 
Russia would raise Europe against him. Were there any rewards he sought for in Europe, in Russia? Not at all. In fact, he claimed he was going to Russia uh, simply in order to win the uh, friendship of Alexander uh, the Tsar. His other idea was that once he'd taken Moscow, he'd march straight on to India, which I think was a bit ambitious. But in any case, this was the first time when Napoleon deliberately decided to, to take the offensive, to commit an act of aggression without suspecting any coalitions or combinations, conspiracies against him. And it really, one can say, it was 1812 which, again, for the first time, produced universal European war. Up to this time, there'd been little patches here and there. They got bigger and bigger. 1812 produced, first of all, Napoleon's arrival in Moscow. He spent there weeks waiting and waiting for the uh, Russian emissaries to come and make peace, and he failed. Even then, this was still a war between France and Russia. But with Napoleon driven out of, of Moscow, driven out of Russia, there then came instead a coalition of the conservative European powers against him. So that what we think of as the great war of all the powers involved was a very short war between 1813 and 1814. And incidentally, of course, the British contribution was always peripheral on the edge. The British army in Spain did not arrive in France until Napoleon had already been defeated. There was, of course, an epilogue when Napoleon, having been exiled to Elba, <laughs> This is the last curious little war. The last of the Napoleonic wars was started simply because Nap Napoleon turned up and said he wanted to be emperor again, at which all the powers of Europe put him to the ban of Europe and declared that he was an international criminal. And it was with this and with what we uh, remember as the wonderful Battle of Waterloo that the Napoleonic wars ended. In appearance, it seemed that nothing had been achieved by all this 20 years, that the old order had been restored, that the rights of man had been forgotten, and that uh, the beginnings of modern times had been pushed away. But all the same, something had been achieved. It was for a very short period that, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, and kings crept out to feel the sun again. <laughs>